Hey, good evening, everybody. Everybody. Tonight's topic title is "What Did Dart Do?" NASA's Asteroid Smasher and its Paparazzo Companion. Last September 26, the double asteroid redirection test spacecraft deliberately crashed into a small asteroid, Dimorphos. The Dart mission was investigating a possible technique for moving asteroids, perhaps useful someday for a planetary defense if a threatening object is ever discovered. <coughs> An Italian spacecraft, Lycia Cube, L I C I A Cube, accompanied DART, snapping pictures of its final moments and the messy plume of its aftermath. Bill Higgins examines the mission plan and the spectacular results. Bill Higgins frequently speaks about space flight and astronomy. He works as a radiation safety physicist at Fermilab and he's been an NAA member since 1989 and a volunteer in NASA's Solar System Ambassador Outreach Program since 1999. Recently, he was science guest of honor at WindyCon 48, science fiction convention. Just welcome, Bill. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very pleased and indeed honored uh, once again to be invited here. Uh, I want to congratulate Joe personally. Uh, where he, where, where, there he is, <laughs> and, and uh, because I've I've known him a long time, uh, and uh, and this sounds like a great a great astronomical league program, um, so good going, uh, and I'm going to start up my slides. Uh, the topic for tonight is the Dart mission, uh, the dual asteroid, uh, or is it double asteroid re redirect mission, uh, which uh, which. Which is one of one of your more science fictional uh, uh, space missions, um, and uh, uh, as uh, as Kurt mentioned, I'm a volunteer in NASA's Solar System Ambassadors Program. So, uh, in exchange for agreeing to give some presentations or do community outreach activities, uh, I uh, NASA uh, provides us with. Uh, with occasional briefings or slide sets or or other information about uh, uh, about uh, their work, um, and indeed you'll see uh, uh, patched together slides in different formats from different other people's uh, presentations in this talk, and a few that I put together myself. Uh, and I particularly <coughs> like to thank uh, Dr. Nancy Chabot and Dr. Uh, Tarek Daly for for of of uh, the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, applied Physics Laboratory, uh, J-H-U-A-P-L, uh, built this spacecraft and, uh, and uh, ran this mission. Um, uh, I've also got help from Kay Ferrari, who runs the Solar System Ambassadors operations at, uh, at, at, at JPL. And then we'll, me, me, most of our, my images come either from NASA or from the... Uh, uh, f from from the European Space Agency or uh, the Agencia Spaziale Italiana (ASI), the Italian <laughs> Space Agency, which, as we'll see, uh, is uh, is contributed uh, contributed Lichia Cube to this uh, this mission, uh, and I'll I'll get into that some more. But uh, yes, it's double asteroid redirection test. And very simply, uh, the the uh, it's a test of 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 a, of a way of deflecting an asteroid, and the way of deflecting the asteroid is to bring a spacecraft toward it with as much uh, kinetic energy as you can muster, and simply crash into the <coughs> asteroid. It's conceptually simple, uh, and uh, the impact occurred 11 million kilometers from here on. Uh, on, on, on the 26th of September, as we said. Here, yeah, okay. Um, this is all in the context of so-called planetary defense. NASA has even uh, acquired in, in recent years a planetary defense uh, uh, division uh, directorate, so, so they, uh, uh, they're working on these problems. And because uh, we, we know that, uh, that some so, so, so some bad things have happened to people and creatures on Earth in the past because of falling space rocks. And uh, the, I'm going to go through this slide uh, sort of right to left because 
the ones that you'd be most worried about, the consequences of, is if one of the big ones hit, right? Uh, 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 the, uh, the, the solar system is full of objects. Uh, there's a whole asteroid belt, which really doesn't uh, concern us here. Uh, but there are other stray asteroids that go other places from time to time. And a few of them come into the inner solar system and come somewhere near the Earth's orbit in their own orbits around the sun. Okay, uh, if they come within, I think in the, this chart, uh, the parameter is that if they come, if, if, if the asteroid occasionally comes within maybe uh, 50 uh, million kilometers of the Earth's orbit, it's, a, it, it's, it's one of the ones that they're counting, one of the ones they're thinking. That's, that's sometimes a, a near-Earth uh, asteroid. Well, if a really big one hits, like a uh, 10, 10 kilometer wide uh, asteroid, then very bad ha things happen to your, to your planet. And this is the, the famous dinosaur killer of, uh, uh, that, that left a crater in Chicxulub uh, in Yucatan uh, um, 65 million years ago, right? Uh, you can get global devastation that's so bad that it causes mass extinctions and a whole lot of the species disappear, uh, including possibly your species. Uh, so that's bad, but fortunately, an important fact about um, about asteroids is that there are only a few big ones, and there are more little ones, and there are even more, even smaller ones in an, uh, an exponential way. So of all of the, uh, the, there, the, there's really quite a lot of, of 10 kilometer rocks in the uh, solar system. It's proper, but uh, but the near of the near Earth ones. Uh, there are only about four, and the the, the searches for them uh, are, have uh, have been good enough in recent years that uh, that uh, NASA's confident they found all of the, the uh, objects in this class. Now, uh, you could also get a smaller one, right? Like maybe just about one kilometer. Uh, wide, it doesn't. It ha they, they, those uh, there's more of them. They show up more frequently, maybe every half million years, and they can cause sort of continental scale devastation, which is uh, which is uh, very bad, uh, bad climate effects, and it says here possible collapse of civilization. Uh, eloquently put. Um, <laughs> uh, there are about 900 of those that are in a class where they could they come by here sometimes, they come somewhat close to the Earth's orbit. None of them, no, nothing on this, on this chart is an object that, that's known <coughs> to be on track to hit the Earth. Uh, and in particular, the, we, we don't know of any big ones that, that are very serious that are uh, likely to, to, to hit the Earth. So, um, and by the way, uh, I'd appreciate it if the people in the back would let me know if my voice drops to an inaudible level, right? Because uh, we're, we're projecting here, we don't have a microphone. Uh, so I'd, I'd like a little heads up uh, if, if I need to be louder. The, um, okay, fine. So these are infrequent, but, uh, but, 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 but they come along more, uh, more often than these. Okay, uh, now here are, uh, that, that, uh, here are rocks that are uh, of, of maybe a hundred meters or a couple hundred meters across that could uh, that could actually be you know mess with a city or, or mess with a sort of metropolitan area, metropolitan area a state. These are a lot more frequent and the and, and we might get one this size showing up every let's say twenty five thousand years. Um, there are uh, in the sky probably about 20,000 that might occasionally cross the Earth's uh, orbit or might someday cross the Earth's orbit. And, uh, and the, we, we believe that the searches have found, it says here, 42% of them. Um, this, is, uh, this, this won't wipe out our civilization if it hits. So it's a little less of a, uh, of a threat in its, uh, in its consequences. And uh, um, much more frequent, we have stuff in the 25 meter class that, uh, that these actually show up sort of one or two per century, and, uh, and there are millions of these, and we really haven't mapped them very well because they're small and dim and hard to see in the telescope. 
Uh, so uh, that's kind of the frontier for, uh, for searching and cataloging at the moment. Uh, I made a note here that, uh, um, that the object that made Meteor Crater was probably about 50 meters across. So um, sort of in this class and, uh, and considerably smaller than the 160 meter uh, guy there. Oh, you got a, so a laser? There's an off-on switch on it. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. I really tried pushing all the buttons, but not in the right order, I guess. Uh, the, uh, so um, it gets to be kind of interesting here because we might see them every once in a while. Um, in, uh, uh, in 1908, we got a 50 meter object that, uh, that uh, hit uh, in Tunguska in Siberia. And uh, in uh, 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 20, 2013, was it? Uh, Chelyabinsk in, in Russia. Uh, saw one of similar size uh, uh, that uh, that disintegrated in the air, but the shock wave of its uh, of its passage uh, broke lots of windows, uh, and, uh, and and it was uh, it was sort of also uh, about I guess I guess it was a it was sort of a, a twenty meter object. Um, uh, the uh, and so that definitely caused a lot of injuries in a widespread uh, in a in a populated area. Um, nobody died, as far as I know, but about 1,200 people were were treated for injuries. The uh, also the, it was February in uh, in the middle of Russia, and the uh, uh, suddenly a shockwave broke every window in town, or a great huge number of windows. And uh, that's got to be bad if, uh, if when, when you need your windows need repairing in February, and the uh, and everyone in town has also lost their windows. You might be in a, a long line waiting for for a repair there. Uh, okay, little ones a few meters across are pretty frequent, uh, about uh, about once per year, and there are hundreds of millions of them, and we haven't. Uh, come close to mapping them. Only, only rarely do we do we spot them. Uh, and uh, there was one spotted in November. It's at, in, in fact that uh, that that where the where it was discovered, and predictions said it's on a trajectory that will hit the Earth in a few hours. And I was on Twitter at the time, so uh, I had a great time watching the drama unfold as this thing got closer and closer and people figured out where where it was going to uh, hit, probably an airburst disintegration. And, uh, and I got really excited when I found out it was going to hit over southern Ontario, because southern Ontario is the home of the University of Western Ontario. And, the, and this location is just sort of crammed with instruments to observe meteorites, or oh, meteors, I guess you'd say. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sure that their instruments got good pictures and infrasound and radar uh, uh, information, and I, I look forward to the research papers. Uh, Was the prediction accurate? Where it hit? Yes, yes. It uh, it uh, it kind of air burst in places where Hamilton, Ontario, could could see it. Woke people up in in Hamilton, and uh, and the pieces fell down mostly in Lake Erie. But maybe there's maybe you could still find some on the beach. If you if you went there, you said how far from the Earth it burst? How far from Earth it burst? How high up did it burst? I don't happen to know that. Um, if you're worried about rocks hitting, you're not. Uh, uh, then then very serious damage is rare. Uh, and very small uh, amounts of damage, or, or very very small s small uh, objects are are, are frequent. Uh, but uh, the obviously the first priority, if you're interested in defending the planet, is uh, and has has always been and continues to be mapping them, finding all of the objects that uh, that are in the, passing the vicinity of the Earth and cataloging their orbits and uh, and perhaps keeping an eye on them. In, in the future. The, uh, when you find one and you find its orbit, you can nail that down and you pretty much know um, if your observations are, are, are good uh, and you get other astronomers to follow it up, you probably know that it's not going to hit the Earth 
in the next century, or maybe the next few centuries. But there is uncertainty in the, in the measurements, and also uh, this, the, the future path of an asteroid is going to depend on perturbations from, uh, from, from all the planets in the solar system, so tiny, tiny wiggles in the, in, uh, of gravitational force will, uh, could result in large changes someday in the, in the shape of an orbit. So we can't predict these things really far out, but we can, uh, we, 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 we know where we can relax and we don't expect anything big to hit us any time in the next uh, uh, couple centuries. Well, uh, this search should obviously continue. There's a lot of ground-based telescopes doing it, some with new technology, and uh, to cover some of the uh, some of the corners of the sky or the or, or some of the methods that uh, that help out. Uh, NASA is planning to fly a, a, a new space telescope, a half meter space telescope called NEO Surveyor in the future, and that's all I'm going to say about that. The other part of the planetary defense program is, uh, is what if we find one? What if we find an asteroid that we're worried about, uh, or, or maybe even a comet? Uh, those are harder to, to, to find well in advance. Uh, and it really is on track to, uh, to, 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 to hit the Earth. Um, sometime in the future. Uh, can we do anything about it? Can we move it? Can we shatter it into small pieces we don't have to worry about? Can we, uh, can we do something to, uh, can we move the Earth out of the way? I guess I should ask that question because in principle um, uh, the, the answer is usually no. Uh, <laughs> but um, you start to think of methods and people have been thinking about methods for a long time and it's kind of a fun thing to do. So, so, um, so it's been studied, and uh, the very rare, very large uh, objects that, uh, that, that are the most worrisome, <coughs> but also the most rare, are up here. And because they're large and very massive, they would be hard to move. They would require a fantastic amount of energy to uh, to give them uh, give them a nudge, or uh, or um, and, and destroying them is not really a good idea. But um, at the same time, this problem is hard if the, the the asteroid is coming very soon, like next year or next month. Uh, but it's a lot easier problem if you find this thing a hundred years before it's, uh, it's due to, uh, to smack into the Earth. Uh, because if you have time, uh, then the amount of force, the amount of energy that you have to put into, uh, into changing its path is smaller. You can put a, 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 apply a much smaller amount of energy and, uh, and, and, and wait for uh, 50 or 100 years for, for, uh, for it to take effect. Um, so that methods that are not fantastically you know, comic book, Hollywood, gigantic explosions or whatever become uh, somewhat uh, plausible. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is, this is the realm that we're, that we're in for this experiment. Like, uh, okay, this is setting off nuclear bombs, which is Hollywood's favorite way to do it, right? Uh, but uh, down here, if, uh, if you've got a... Uh, a smaller object, like a 100 meter, 150 meter object that you're, uh, that you're worried about, and you have, oh, a decade or two to, uh, for, to deal with the problem, then a kinetic method where you uh, trans transfer the, the energy of a fast spacecraft to, uh, to the asteroid itself, that's plausible. There's, uh, the, there's the gravity trekker method where if you've got plenty of time, you could try flying a spacecraft near the object and then using the tiny gravitational force between your spacecraft and the object uh, to slowly fly the spacecraft um, where you want the asteroid to go and hope that the asteroid follows it according to Newton's laws. Um, and uh, down here, if, uh, if you're threatened by a small object and you don't have much warning, or even if you have a lot of warning, that uh, preparing people for the impact is a good idea, 
for instance, if we'd known the <coughs> Chelyabinsk object was coming, we would tell people to stay indoors and in particular, don't stand near the windows. Even if you hear a bang outside, don't go to the window to find out, uh, to see what's happening. Uh, uh, so civil defense measures would, would, would work. Um, well, the DART mission is an experiment and that, uh, uh, this thing doesn't work that way, okay. The third mission is an experiment that is operating right here. Uh, in, uh, we, we, we have a 160 meter uh, object that, uh, that DART aims to, uh, to move, to change the orbit of, and, uh, and it's the first time anybody has tried uh, anything like this. Um, the, the object in question is the asteroid Dimorphos, which is quite small as, as asteroids go and, and you know, hard, uh, hard, hard for us to detect either uh, even. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is sort of the size range. It's, it's uh, you know, around the uh, size of a couple of pyramids uh, or, uh, or something like a sports stadium. And it's way bigger than the Statue of Liberty. And, and so forth, and it's way shorter than a lot of skyscrapers. Uh, uh, it, it, I, I will go into this more, but uh, Dimorphos has a companion and, uh, uh, named, named Didymos, which is a, a bigger asteroid, but still not very big. It's less than a kilometer uh, across, and uh, it fits in between these two famous buildings. Um, the DART spacecraft itself is shown here as 19 meters uh, long, but that's that's actually the stretch of its solar panels, which are kind of flimsy. Most of the mass of this thing is in a box the size of a vending machine at the center. But that's what we're uh, talking about. So what happens when a spacecraft hits uh, a, a cosmic body is a question that uh, the people try to understand with simulations taking everything we know about asteroid surfaces and the stuff they're made out of and the size distribution of the particles that might be in there and so forth. Um, we, uh, and, uh, and, and dropping a simulated object in there at high speed. This, uh, this cartoon is part of a, a simulation like that and you might notice that it's uh, the, the whole duration of the event we're, we're watching is only uh, about two thousandths of a second. Uh, it's the first couple of milliseconds of the uh, of, of, uh, of the impact, and uh, it, it's it's sort of vaporizing or, or turning to liquid some of the material, and uh, it's also sh uh, the the energy is now going into uh, a, a, com a shock wave, a, a, a compression effect that's spreading out radially from the center of the uh, of the explosion. This uh, this this cavity here, and that's going to get bigger as, as the milliseconds roll on into seconds and minutes. Uh, so so uh, the, we, we can't really do this experiment over and over for asteroid after asteroid, so it's, uh, uh, it's good to have simulation software that we believe is, is pretty good and can model a situation for, uh, for, for whatever uh, whatever object you're, you're interested in. And as we think about modeling and as we think about how much could we change the orbit of uh, an asteroid by, uh, by, by, by crashing into it, uh, the math, mm, the, 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 the uh, detailed simulation is messy, <coughs> but the math kind of boils down to an important uh, dimensionless figure of merit, as we say in physics. Uh, which uh, in this uh, in this trade is called beta. Uh, beta uh, is a measure of uh, of uh, how much of the momentum of the spacecraft when it crashes it gets transferred to the target body. And if you think of a totally inelastic collision where the spacecraft hits and uh, and the asteroid the stubborn asteroid eats. The energy of the spacecraft, but doesn't uh, react much beyond that. Uh, then, uh, then, then we get beta equals one. Um, if instead the material of the body you're crashing into is 
uh, is fragile, and uh, and the the the, the shockwave energy can turn into scattering a lot of pieces of the surface uh, hither and yon, but mostly yon. Uh, that is, uh, the uh, stuff gets splattered off the impact site and uh, and goes up into the sky uh, above the impact site. The mass of the material that uh, that's getting cleared out of the crater we're making uh, and the speed of the various particles in that material, you know, um, boulders and gravel that get flung upwards, uh, contribute in the way that a rocket exhaust does to the change of momentum of the, the massive body. Uh, and uh, so throwing, uh, throwing rocks uh, would help the mission of the spacecraft and beta would get bigger, uh, to be a bigger number, like two in this example. Uh, if there's a moderate amount of ejecta when the spacecraft hits and tries to make a, a, a crater, um, and uh, and if it's uh, if it's really loose and there's a lot of uh, material available, then you might get a very large beta that uh, that uh, is a sig significant uh, gain on your investment uh, of spacecraft momentum uh, here, um, and, and uh, so if a question if you're we're trying this experiment and hoping that the results can be applied uh, to future experiments or, God forbid, future practical demonstrations when we need to move on an asteroid, uh, then, uh, um, then, then measuring the beta of a real spacecraft hitting a real asteroid can, tell, uh, can, can help us improve the modeling software and, uh, and have some confidence uh, in the simulations the next time we have to do that. Uh, now, Okay, we're, we're, we've got a uh, an asteroid. That's our target. We uh, we 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 get we understand this simple idea, uh, which a kindergartner could re understand really, of crashing a spacecraft into it and trying to uh, jar it into a, a different orbit. Fine. How do you measure how well you've done? You want to measure what's let's face it, going to be a quite small change in the velocity of uh, something the size of. The small mountain, or you know, at least a hill, a couple great pyramids. <laughs> um, that's not easy to do. I mean, uh, a, 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 an object that's 160 meter across can barely, maybe not at all, be seen by a ground-based telescope. Um, so, how do you get a precise measurement of the uh, orbit? Someone came up with a clever idea a few years back. We should find a clock and then see if the speed of the clock speeds up or, or, or slows down. And it turns out that there are many binary asteroids, and we're always discovering more in the solar system, situations where um, one rock and another rock are in an orbit around each other. Uh, if, if one is very big, and the other one is uh, small, then we, we casually say that the little one, uh, Dimorphos here, is, uh, is, a, is a moon of, uh, of Didymos. Sometimes they're closer in size. But binary asteroids exist. They can be, we find out about them because we can watch them, uh, uh, not, not because we can resolve them in our telescopes. They're, they're always a point of light. Uh, unless you fly a spacecraft up to them and, and take a look. But we're very good, as, as you know, at measuring the light coming from a star, an asteroid, a planet, or some other celestial object, and, and measuring tiny variations uh, with time in, uh, in the light. Uh, um, the occultation folks do that. Uh, it's a, it's a well-known method now for, uh, for, for studying exoplanets. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, this binary asteroid, um, we, uh, we would see from the ground uh, that uh, Dimorphos, uh, uh, every once in a while, goes into Didymos' shadow. And the total light that a telescope measures from, uh, fr from this uh, 
uh, from the system would abruptly drop only by a little bit because because this tiny uh, uh, moonlet is uh, is only a small uh, fraction of the area of, uh, of of Didymos, but 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 enough, right? Enough that you can measure it. And there's another situation where it's passing in front, and you occasionally uh, get a shadow of, uh, of of Dimorphos going in front of Didymos and subtracting a little bit from the total light coming from the system. So there's a small bump, and these. Big bumps and small bumps, because uh, it's all they're all based on the orbit, they happen with great regularity. Essentially, this is a clock. And uh, if, you, uh, if you are patient and you do your photometry with your telescope and, uh, and, uh, and get other astronomers to help you, you can watch this thing uh, as a very stable piece of a uh, uh, very stable system. And, uh, and what you need is a system like this that's a, a clock that we can observe and uh, a, a binary asteroid system that happens to be somewhere near enough to the Earth that a spacecraft can get there. Uh, and, uh, and, you could, and that would be a candidate for a target. Of course, uh, everyone always asks this question. Uh, you want it to be to pass near enough to the Earth that you can nicely observe the system, but of course you want, uh, want, want this uh, these two rocks to have no possibility of colliding with the Earth. Uh, and uh, let's see, I already said the sizes of these things. The period of this clock is that one orbit is completed uh, every 11 hours and 55 minutes, so just about half a day. Uh, and uh, I probably don't have to say this, but it's obvious that you should uh, of, of the two, you should target the smaller asteroid because it will be easier for your spacecraft to move, the little one. Uh, and uh, Dimorphos uh, is uh, about the size of a stadium, and I got this picture from the European Space Agency, and this is their favorite stadium. This is Europe's favorite stadium, uh, and I can't disagree. Uh, the Roman Col Colosseum. And here is a, a picture that's a thumbnail sketch of the entire mission. Uh, take a spacecraft, launch it, uh, let's say near the end, around Thanksgiving of 20, 2021, um, let it fly for a few months to, uh, to the Didymos uh, Dimorphos system as they, uh, as they travel together in their, uh, their large orbit around the, the solar system, and in the re in the, in the, at the moment when, when they come closest to Earth so that it's most convenient for us to observe this stuff, we observe everything with, uh, with, with ground-based telescopes and whatever space telescopes we can get time on. And we watch DART crash into uh, Dimorphos. And then uh, the speed change ought to turn into a, a, a small change in the orbital period of uh, uh, Dimorphos and uh, a change in the orbital period is something you, you can't resolve either one of these in a telescope, but looking at the brightening and darkening dot, you can d easily tell the period. Uh, so it was hoped to, to, uh, uh, to uh, that dark could, could slow this thing down by at least maybe a minute and a half, uh, uh, more if we're, if we're lucky. Uh, and here's the slide that's the same slide but with much de busy detail that might answer your questions about distances or masses of spacecraft or, uh, or where did this take place and stuff. Uh, uh, 6 11 million kilometers, 6.8 million miles uh, from Earth at the moment of impact. Um, the, uh, um, and uh, orbital periods, uh, about a kilometer separation between these, so this is a very small, cozy system. Uh, and, uh, and possibly if you were standing in Dimorphos and your friend was standing on Didymos, you could probably wave at each other because uh, you really wouldn't be that far away from each other. Uh, Didymos spins, uh, ro rotates itself uh, 2.26 hours, uh, uh, and the whole clock of the of the system is, as I said, almost 12 hours. Um, oh, and here's, a, here's an interesting detail that um, DART is a big spacecraft uh, moving pretty fast. It has an ion engine and, uh, and, and, and state-of-the-art solar panels and stuff, but it carried with it a much smaller spacecraft, Lychia Cube, 
the uh, Italian Space Agency's uh, CubeSat, uh, which uh, popped out on September 15th and was released. Uh, it has a couple cameras aboard, and it was able to uh, to absorb, uh, sorry, to, to observe the uh, the the collision and and. Uh, and report back scientifically. And nobody else in the solar system could resolve this this tiny uh, binary system, but Lichia Cube was right there and got uh, good pictures of uh, of, uh, of of both asteroids. Um, so, uh, by the way, no one else but me s s refers to this as a paparazzo spacecraft, <laughs> but it is. It is one of the paparazzi. It is certainly a photographer that's hanging around hoping to get pictures of some uh, event, preferably a famous event, right? And that's uh, the word originated with Italy, and that's exactly the mission of this uh, spacecraft. Here's DART. Um, uh, what, what did we say? Uh, 676 kilograms when it's uh, fully fueled, uh, and uh, it's a deep space uh, spacecraft that looks a lot like the others. Um, it has a little dish, or a, a high gain antenna, a dish antenna, I guess, uh, uh, so at some part of it. Uh, it is in, uh, it, it is ion propulsion, I, I think, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's an ion propulsion spacecraft, so the ion engine is here. It needs, uh, that, that means it would be hungry for, uh, for solar panels, so it has uh, a new kind of, uh, of solar panels that unroll like window shades and extend uh, uh, for a total of 19 meters here. Uh, the, uh, and it has a really good camera uh, inside this uh, conical sunshade here, and the camera's called Draco. And Draco's job is to, uh, <coughs> to spot the um, Didymos and Dimorphos they're not going to be more than a dot in the camera or any, anybody's telescope until sort of uh, until this thing is close enough uh, that it's about an hour until collision. So, uh, so, so DART had to be equipped with software that could take uh, images from from uh, Draco and uh, and uh, do its own image processing and figure out. Um, are we heading the right way until the thrusters to aim uh, somewhat uh, to, to, to fire to keep it uh, aimed uh, and by the way and, and eventually it would, the dot would become two dots and then it had to figure out which one of those was the smaller of the asteroids and steer toward that and there really wasn't time for feedback loops to come from the ground and say ah I see you're getting closer go this way so it, it needed to be an uh, autonomous robot finding its own way, uh, and that was a technical challenge. Here's Lichia Cube. Uh, it's, uh, I, at first when I heard about this, I thought, oh, how cute. There's a small satellite. It's got some cameras. It'll take pictures. And then I started thinking, how does this actually work? Like, if it was my job to fly a CubeSat to observe a collision, um, how would I know how close to be, how far away from me, how, how far away to, to be, what uh, what the timing of things was? Doesn't uh, Lichia Coop have to do in the, in the last couple of weeks its own navigation to make sure it's uh, going toward the right asteroid, but also passing it by a wide berth and staying out of any zone where the ejecta might be coming up, uh, you know, rocks flying into space because uh, you don't want your uh, your photographer to hit any gravel, um, and uh, you know that turned. So I started reading up on Leachy Cube, and it's kind of interesting. Um, let's see, it's based on a family of cubesats, uh, one of which is now uh, uh, in in uh, what was launched on uh, on SLS this fall. Um, after after the events we're talking like, about about here, and you know, it's in cislunar space now. Um, there's a there's a uh, high resolution uh, monochrome camera and a lower resolution color camera. Uh, they they uh, and at the at the very <coughs> closest, they should have been able to see about two meters per pi pixel uh, at the at the peak of the flyby. And what they Decided was the uh, that, that 
leachic cube should should fly fly past with a closest approach that's uh, it was about three minutes after the impact to get well, the best how results. How close was it then? Uh, fifty-eight kilometers. Um, so you know, here to Chicago, maybe. Uh, right, that's far enough away that uh, maybe <laughs> gravel that was liberated from the surface three minutes ago hasn't had time to come to cross your path yet. Uh, but close enough that maybe your cameras can get decent. Uh, uh, decent pictures. It's not, uh, they're not the greatest of pictures as, as we'll see, but or that, that is, uh, you might wish for more detail. Uh, uh, here's Lisha Cube. It's sort of the size of a suitcase and it rode along in a little box uh, uh, with a spring loaded uh, release uh, and it was ejected on the 11th of September, so uh, 15 days before the impact. And Lisha Cube had a number of jobs. Uh, to uh, take pictures of the collision and plume, pl and, uh, plume of ejecta, to see the crater that the, uh, the collision was leaving behind, if at all possible, it was thought may maybe the plume would obscure the crater, or <coughs> maybe maybe you could see the crater. Getting the uh, information on the shape and the structure of uh, of, of both Denimus, Denimus and uh, and Dimorphos was something it could do. Um, turn around after the flyby and look back and get some good images of the the side that wasn't impacted to learn more about, about this asteroid, characterize it, that would help uh, feed into study estimates of the mass, for instance. Um, and with the color camera, you could uh, get some clues about the, the composition. So actually, this is a good bit of science for a small uh, spacecraft to do. The Alicia Q folks decided that they are uh, their cameras are made, uh, they were going to be called Luke for the color one and Leia for the, um, for the monochrome one. And uh, I'll leave, the, you, leave you to read the tortured acronyms <laughs> that scientists like so, so well. And uh, the whole assembly, both spacecraft, uh, launched on the 23rd of November of last year. And, uh, and Ed Whitman had a cool picture of the, the launch. This is from Vandenberg Air Force Base, and it's a Falcon 9. Um, uh, he had a cool picture that Aviation Week uh, published in its Pictures of the Year, so I thought, I'll put that in the slideshow. Here is the, the neighborhood. Here is our neighborhood. And in order to orient you to uh, where this is all going on, so here's the Earth, and here is the Sun at the, at the center of all these circles. And we see the paths of Mercury and Venus and a blue ring, that's the Earth uh, circling the sun. Okay, so keep your eye on the blue ring. The orbit of Mars is in here. And you can see that uh, the orbit of Didymos and, with Dimorphos uh, circling it is an ellipse that, uh, with a fair eccentricity that, uh, that goes out beyond the orbit of Mars. The period is just about two years. It's uh, 770 days. And so every couple of years, it, uh, it, it reaches uh, its aphelion and, and comes back uh, and, and sort of a one year later is, uh, is, is passing at, at its uh, perihelion, right? The closest point to the sun. And that sort of kisses the Earth's orbit. So uh, the, the uh, encounter that uh, we're talking about, the impact, took place right around here uh, in September after about 10 months of flight. Um, and uh, does this slide really add anything to our information? Well, this is a, we're now seeing a dart come in from the, the right on this picture. And it's, uh, it's watching uh, the asteroid system very carefully and, uh, and, and, and trying to keep correcting and stay, uh, stay, stay on, uh, on, on, on impact point that's more or less at the center of, uh, of, of Dimorphos as it sees uh, um, Dimorphos. And Lichia Cube is three minutes behind, uh, cruising along. And the goal of the mission was to, to change Dimorphos' orbital period by about 1%. Uh, uh, and let's see. After the impact, as planned, Lichia Cube did its uh, did its observations. Uh, the 
to, to determine any change in the period, you really got to watch these uh, do do light curves photometry on uh, on this this asteroid system for a long for long enough to get good information about the uh, about the wiggles in the in the period. So even though it's sort of every 12 hours, uh, you got to watch it for many days. And in fact, it took more than two weeks for them to give a preliminary answer. Uh, to uh, the light curve. As I said, the original period was 11 hours, 55 minutes, and uh, uh, the, we, we slowed Dimorphos with the impact, and, uh, and watch it, if, if it slows, and we can measure the new uh, orbital period, which tells us the new orbital velocity, we can find out how much the speed of the, uh, of the, uh, of the of Dimorphos changed, and that gives us, uh, that, 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 that can give us a calculation of beta. Uh, how well we, did we do, how much extra help did we get from, uh, from the debris uh, plume. There's going to be a follow-up with this because uh, the United States and the European Space Agency uh, are cooperating on, uh, on a, a planetary defense scheme or on this, uh, on this experiment. So uh, two years from now, I guess launching Launching in 2024. Oh, okay. And uh, that the um, the Hera spacecraft will uh, will visit and will, will arrive and go into orbit around uh, Dimorphos in 2026, and it will deploy a couple of cubesats. There's a slide about that later on. So you're wondering, what did we see? Right? When the when when Dart got close with this very nice camera got close enough to see uh, Didymos, the big one, and Dimorphos, the little one, how did they appear? This is the, the last picture of Didymos uh, that shows all of Didymos, and uh, we have some closer pictures that are only like corners as, as Didymos slides out of the picture and Draco stays, uh, concentrates on, uh, on uh, Dimorphos, but, uh, but you know, now we have a new asteroid that's been visited and we can, uh, we can study the heck out of out, out of those uh, brief images. Dimorphos uh, um, is uh, uh, filled the uh, filled the field of view at a later time. Uh, so we got kind of a sharper looking picture here. It really uh, resembles the other asteroids that have been visited recently by um, Osiris Rex, the asteroid Benning, or uh, Hayabusa 2, which brought back samples from uh, from uh, the asteroid Ryugu uh, or Hayabusa one that visited Aitokawa, mm -hmm. all these, uh, all the pictures of all these, uh, all these uh, asteroids look like quote rubble piles, gravel, um, a whole lot of uh, a jumble of big big blocks and and small uh, small gravel like uh, regolith particles. And here are Dart's final moments. Uh, you can see that uh, Dimorphos uh, uh, goes off to the bottom uh, left of the picture. Oh, sorry, sorry, Didymos goes that goes off as uh, as we uh, as we get closer and we lose interest in uh, in the big one, and but we get much much better uh, pictures of uh, of uh, Dimorphos and uh, and a lot of detail of the of the impact site and the spacecraft is trying its best, but only manages to get out part of a frame at the very last uh, <coughs> frame moment of impact. Uh, oh, and, and I guess you could, th this is, this picture is kind of jittery. It's moving around a little bit, and that's because of uh, uh, Dart is making targeting corrections and trying to trying to uh, get a, give a more and more accurate trajectory. So it's firing its engines and that's making the camera, the picture jump around in the camera. So Lichia Cube is out. It's still sort of, at, at the moment of this impact, about 700 kilometers away or so. And, uh, it, and it sees a big bright rock that's Didymos. Um, it sees a small dim rock, uh, that's Dimorphos, uh, and Dimorphos suddenly gets very much brighter than it was. 
uh, and might even sort of outshine its uh, it, its its larger buddy. Uh, and uh, so here's a little a little blink of two uh, two frames that uh, show you that effect. Uh, this uh, and here's a, a lot of frames as uh, as we follow Lichia Cube in to its uh, closest approach to 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 Dimos, uh, to, to, to Dimorphos. I guess closest approach to both of them. But uh, it starts out sort of uh, 700 kilometers uh, away, and it comes in and. Uh, the, the bigger, the, Didymos is more apparent here, Dimorphos is down here. Uh, and you can see the numbers of how far away <coughs> um, uh, Dimorphos is up here in this counter. That, uh, that it's, uh, uh, we're coming back in again as, as we loop this picture. So the numbers are getting smaller and uh, there's, when, when after close approach, uh, Lichia Cube slews around and looks behind it and, uh, and gets a picture of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the far side of these, uh, of these two asteroids. And uh, the back side of the plume, which is lit a different way and might, uh, might give you a few clues about particle size and so forth. But that's, that's the product. This isn't really high resolution, but it's way better than nothing. Uh, it is uh, a lot of, of, it is a fair detail, uh, and certainly our best uh, pictures of the, uh, of the impact plume, and the only pictures of the impact plume a few moments after the, uh, uh, after the collision. Uh, and putting this together with telescope pictures of uh, of, of the plume as it evolves and, and gets big enough to notice uh, in the, in the, from Earth. Um, that'll help you do some science. And this slide illustrates what I just said, the before, uh, before closest approach and after closest approach here uh, pictures. And here's a color version of that from the Luke camera. Um, ju just, uh, uh, this is eight seconds before the uh, the closest approach of Lichia Cube, and this is seven seconds after the, the, the closest approach as we're swiveling and looking behind. Um, and the colors give a little bit of information about the composition uh, and maybe some clues about the evolution of the, uh, of the plume material. Meanwhile, I say, here, back on Earth, um, it was night in Africa. And, uh, and this, uh, this asteroid pair was visible sort of in southern skies. So, um, uh, so, so, so observatories in, in Africa and, and, and elsewhere in, the so in that half of the southern hemisphere were, uh, were best suited for, for seeing uh, the impact. Uh, the uh, South African Astronomical Observatory has a site in uh, near a city called Sutherland, and uh, there are lots of telescopes there. Uh, one of them uh, belongs to uh, the University of Hawaii's Atlas Project, and uh, which is uh, trying to map asteroids and uh, every night. and uh, And they got a really excellent series of pictures. And sure enough, wait, we were wondering: Will the flare be? Will the, will the plume be visible from 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 Earth? And it is excellently visible, and you really can see material blasted off the surface and moving away from uh, from Dimorphos and uh, and, and Didymos. Uh, another, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> another telescope at the same site from uh, a, a one-meter scope from uh, from uh, uh, Los Cobras Observatory's uh, station uh, also shows sort of. Uh, the expand. This is, I think, 12 seconds after impact, and this is 15 seconds after. Uh, sorry, 12 minutes after impact and 15 minutes after impact. So you can see the expanding uh, uh, plume. Um, both uh, the the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, the James Webb Space Telescope were watching. So Hubble got uh, got a good images in uh, <coughs> of the uh, of the progress of the of the the plume development in uh, 
in invisible light, uh, and uh, Webb uh, used uh, near cam to to observe the same phenomena in uh, in near infrared light. They haven't published anything, so I can't really tell you much. I can't interpret much about those uh, pictures, but those are the, the those are the public images now. By the by, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks after the uh, uh, after the encounter, um, <coughs> after the impact, the we we had some more information. There'd been time enough to gather decent light curves. Uh, there had been uh, 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 the Goldstone radar had been brought into play to uh, make some radar observations and uh, and get an independent measurement of the movement of. Uh, of uh, uh, dimorphos and uh, and uh, the d the debris tail continued to continue to evolve. Uh, here's a picture from two days after impact, where we're we're starting to see a a tail stretching uh, uh, for ten thousand kilometers or so, um, and. Uh, <laughs> Hubble took another look uh, 12 days after the impact and saw a, a sort of a immense tail that's beginning to show some structure, some light and dark bands uh, uh, and, uh, and debris going various places and following that structure uh, is, uh, is going to be important in understanding the movements of these particles uh, from the impact. Um, this is a little later, but I'm, I'm throwing it in. Uh, now, uh, there were uh, spectra uh, taken and compared with, uh, with the, the spectrum of, the, of this uh, system before the impact. The blue dots are the pre-impact uh, uh, shape of the spectrum and starting in uh, pretty much the, begin the, 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 the shortest uh, infrared wavelengths and going out to uh, a couple of microns uh, here. Um, uh, 2.5 millionths of, uh, of a meter, uh, and uh, this the material of, the, of, of now almost all. If you point the telescope at the Didymos Dimorphos system, almost all of the light that you get is going to be light reflected off of Didymos because it's larger. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, so so the blue specks, the blue the blue dots are pretty much the spectrum of Didymos and Dimorphos. Just is too small to learn anything about um, by remote sensing from the ground uh, before the impact. But after the impact, uh, Dimorphos got much brighter, right? Because uh, it, it, it's still a little dim rock, but uh, but it's, it had material splattered uh, halfway across the sky, and uh, and that caught the sunlight, and you could one see um, considerably so, so, some brighter light from it than you ever could before. And two, uh, about, what is it, does it say? Two thirds of the light flux that could be measured from the system was now material reflect, or light reflected from, from uh, material that used to be part of uh, uh, Dimorphosis soil. Um, so you could answer a question, like one simple question is, does the spectrum of this splattered stuff look something like the, the spectrum of Didymos's surface, or does it look different? And the fact that these, uh, the, 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 the yellow dots uh, post-impact and the blue dots pre-impact follow pretty much the same uh, curve suggests that, uh, that that there's there's a similar composition uh, of these two asteroids. That's not really very surprising. I mean, if two things are orbiting each other very closely, it wouldn't be surprising to to learn that they had formed together out of the same material. But it's still good to know. And if there's any subtle differences, it'll probably take you know lots of analysis to extract uh, any anything more interesting from. Uh, from, from, from this data, but, uh, but you know, check out the planetary science conferences of 2023 or 2024, and you might learn more. Here's, uh, here's where the money is. Here's what the, 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 the observations that tell us what we really want to know. Uh, uh, every night possible in the southern sky, turn a telescope 
to get to to do uh, uh, photometric measurements uh, uh, and measure light curve hour after hour of uh, of the dimorphos datamos system and then do it again on some other night and keep doing it and maybe you get more than one observatory to do this the, the fine print here lists a whole bunch of observatories actually but so this is our calendar and here is a hundred percent relative brightness by some measure or other um, and uh, here are here's the light curve from the night of September 28 uh, about uh, two days after the uh, uh, after the collision, after the impact, and here's September 29th, and here's September 30th, and this stuff is visible because of weather and what, what not, uh, you know, for different amounts of time, so you get different amounts of closely spaced dots here, but um, there's like, uh, oh, just about every night between September 28th and October 6th, we got some kind of observation here, and <laughs> The, uh, there's a lot of noise in it, uh, but the, the light is wiggling up and down in the way the light curves do. And, uh, and if the system is unchanged and we had the same orbital period, then you would expect a dip in the, uh, a major dip in the, in the light curve every 11 hours and 55 minutes. And we know the phase of that. So it would, there's an expectation of the tick of the clock and uh, according to the previous setting of the clock and that is the gray arrows here we expect a dip under this gray arrow on September 28th and another dip here and here and here and here and here and what was actually measured were curves where the gray arrow here is is expect is a place where we expect a dip if there's a uh, if there's not a change in the orbital period, and instead the uh, the yellow arrows or do you say orange? I don't know, um, are pointing at a uh, uh, a place where they actually observe uh, dips. And these are a couple of example observations from a couple of nights, kind of blown blown up data from the from the top uh, chart. And the answer is that the new orbit appears to have a period of 11 hours and 23 minutes. That dart shortened the period of the clock by 32 minutes, which is spectacularly more than anybody dared hope for when they, uh, when, when they flew this, uh, this project. Uh, dart did a really good job of slowing down the orbit of, uh, of Dimorphos. This means that um, that it the, that the 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 gravel flung out from the collision gave Dart a lot of help, and that Beta is pretty big. So you say, is this Dart physical or just uh, is the Dart when they hit the asteroid? Is something physical here? So uh, Dart. Dart, the Dart spacecraft is 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 crashed at high speed on September 26th into the surface of the asteroid. Uh, so yes, yeah, a physical thing uh, physical. going really fast. Uh, uh, Not laser, but physical. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they 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 crashed the spacecraft in and to to to, to, to see what would happen, uh, and uh, and they have all this math and jargon. To disguise that this is just really a kid crashing a car into a rock. Uh, and who gives the names of this uh, asteroid? Everything is there an agency? On yes, Earth? yes. There, the there's an agency that uh, that keeps track of the names of asteroids. And uh, who gives the name? When the the discoverer gets to name, on, gets gets to give a name to an asteroid, and there are certain rules that the discoverer has to follow. Um, but they're rather broad for asteroids where, let's say, for craters on another planet, the rules are much stricter. Um, and uh, this, uh, I think this, th this pair of asteroids was, was only discovered fairly, you know, in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and they, they, the, they, they get a numerical designation as soon as we have a good orbit for them. And then a few years go by where it's all nailed down and confirmed, and uh, and uh, <coughs> the thing is officially accepted as an asteroid, and then 
the, the discoverer gets to name it. And the IAU sanctions that name? The International Astronomical Union, yeah. Uh, and the, the Minor Planet Center at, uh, is it Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory? Or is it, uh, where's the Minor Planet Center, folks? Uh, they're, they're kind of the agency that keeps track of this uh, stuff, but the International Astronomical Union kind of sets the rules and, you know, is in charge of the big book of asteroid names. Does that answer the questions? That yes. You, okay. Um, I mentioned radar observations. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the 70 meter dish at Goldstone in the Mojave Desert that uh, is uh, uh, famously operated by, uh, by Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the Deep Space Network has a powerful transmitted, transmitter that can be used. In fact, it's our best planetary radar on the planet since, uh, since we lost our SIBO. Um, and uh, Goldstone transmitted, I believe, the Green Bank Observatory uh, uh, telescope was uh, was assisting, so I believe they, I, I haven't seen the details, but I believe it was a so-called bi-static setup where Goldstone transmitter, tra transmits, signal bounces off the, uh, off the asteroid and Green Bank receives. Uh, and uh, there is, radar images look weird uh, and I have uh, forgotten to, how to uh, interpret them in, uh, but, but the, the, I, can't, I can't explain the, the strange distribution of the shape here, but we are told that <coughs> that the, the the stuff in the yellow boxes is uh, is is a reflection from from Didymos. Here's an observation on October 4th, and here's another radar observation on October 9th. Right? <coughs> uh, Dimorphos is also in these pictures, and it's got it's in a green circle. Once again, if Dimorphos had followed its previous path and its previous orbital, orbital period without being disturbed by the, by the impact, we would expect uh, Dimorphos to show up in certain places at certain times, right? Uh, and these blue circles are the, uh, are the expected places for the unperturbed 11 hour, 55 minute orbit. And uh, Dimorphos is not there. Dimorphos is up here. And a couple days later, Dimorphos is down here. The period has changed. It's in a new ellipse uh, around uh, uh, Dimorphos with a shorter period. And this independent of light curve and optical measurements, this is another way to measure what has happened to the, to the clock. Here's uh, uh, some snapshots uh, over uh, a few, um, like sort of an hour or a little more than an hour uh, showing, uh, you, you don't see very much movement in uh, Dimorphos here, but it's kind of uh, fun to observe that <laughs> sequence. Uh, so at, 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 the, at the end, we could say the results are uh, that, we, that the impact produced a spectacular plume, which is interesting and also tells us something about the velocity distribution of stuff uh, in the ejecta, and that'll be important to the modelers and simulators. Um, we, we've learned that the two asteroids seem to have similar composition, uh, and we, know the, we, we learned that the, the whole exercise or, or shortened the orbital <coughs> period by a spectacular 32 minutes, or uh, are about 4.7%. Uh, uh, the, the clock is now running faster, right? 4.7%. So the beta turns out to be 3.8. The investment of momentum that, that we put into a speeding spacecraft that, that, uh, that hit and destroyed itself uh, in, in, in the impact, um, that investment was repaid uh, 3.8 times by help from the material of, uh, of uh, uh, Dimorphos' surface. Yeah? Can you, I know that the, the images on the screen are just, you know, uh, examples, but the orbit of the two, did, did the spacecraft come from behind and hit it from behind, or was it a head-on collision? Because why would it shorten it if you hit it head-on? 
you would think the, yeah. the orbit would be longer because you're slowing, you've slowed down what's orbiting around the large. It rocket. was a head-on collision, and that's the way to get the most difference in speed between your spacecraft and the oncoming asteroid. Okay, it transferred some momentum to this asteroid that had the effect of uh, of slowing it down, but uh, a little paradoxically, the thing about orbits, and you know, if you flew spacecraft, you would know this, uh, that uh, when, when you slow down, you drop. Yeah, I haven't done that recently. Yeah, <laughs> when you slow down, you drop into a lower orbit. So because it lost some speed, it, uh, the Dimorphos was uh, wound up in an orbit that took it closer to Didymos. I see. Um, so it's not going as far. It's not going as far. It's following a path that's a uh, smaller circumference. Right. Um, and it's going uh, slower, but not as far, so that speeds right. it up. Yeah. Well, that does explains it, it. Does it answer? Yeah, does that explains it. Explain it. it? Yeah. It's closer now. Right? Yeah. So while we're on the wacky subject of orbital mechanics, is it possible <laughs> that the overall uh, orbit around the sun of that system has changed? You know, this is some of that energy you get transferred. To the has... The orbit of the system around the sun changed because of this little input of momentum. Um, the answer is probably yes, in principle. That's really hard to measure. Uh, so, and, and if it can be measured at all, we will learn about it for uh, until a much longer period of observation <laughs> has gone by. Uh, here's another thing. Did any of this ejecta stuff wind up on Didymos. Did it and if so, did it change the shape of Didymos? And if there's more gravel on Didymos now than there used to be, does that change Didymos's gravitational field very, very slightly? And because it has a different mass distribution, right? And uh, would that alter Dimorphos's orbit? Uh, in very, very subtle ways. Well, those are like questions we can't answer with the kind of measurements we've got so far. But what if you sent another spacecraft a couple of years later and you went into orbit around Dimorphos and you orbited it for a long time to try to um, understand the, the, the system with much more subtlety and measure its movements uh, more carefully? And you know, if your spacecraft is orbiting Dimorphos all the time, then you know you're going to be using this radio measurements to find out where the spacecraft is and how fast it's moving, and you should get a lot of information about orbit, orbital mechanics from that. So maybe there's some hope for some pretty subtle and weird uh, measurements from the ESA Hera project. Oh, and by the way, it kicks out a couple other uh, satellites, and may, and and it itself can communicate by radio with the satellite. So maybe. Uh, Maybe the, the CubeSats and the mothership will help uh, make subtle doctor <laughs> measurements that will add to this gravity stuff. Yeah? I know the models are approximations, but um, they did much better than they expected to do. Was there any uh, idea why that was in the model, that the model predicted a much lower effect? Yeah, in, in, the, in the papers that the stack of papers, pre-impact papers that kind of lie behind this with pictures of all the simulations. They did a, a variety of, made a variety of assumptions in simulation after simulation about the nature of the surface, how loosely the particles of the soil might be bound, uh, what the distribution of sizes might be, and that kind of stuff to, uh, to try to understand various scenarios. Uh, and they got scenarios where it didn't, but the period didn't change much. And they got scenarios where it changed a lot. And they're the mapping that family of computer results to what they actually saw in terms of plume shape and beta and uh, and uh, details of the dynamics is uh, is part of the job here. Um, and it will uh, it will tell you which of those scenarios may have 
represented the, the true nature of dimorphos correctly. Uh, and, uh, and they may tweak their code when, from stuff that they've learned from, uh, from this. And all in all, hopefully it will improve and benchmark the, uh, the software for the next time somebody wants to do this. Thanks. Um, I have a question over here. Yeah. Bill, how well does this experiment scale up? In other words, if you saw a dinosaur level asteroid coming at us and we lost, how big an impactor would we have to have and how fast would it have to go? Does this thing scale to, to a useful information like that? Um, for extremely large targets, uh, you just may, you, you may need to be able to manipulate more energy than an impactor can provide. <clears throat> or you may need like a fleet of 100 impactors uh, banging on the asteroid again and again and again. Uh, and maybe not too hard because you don't want to break it up, you right. want to move it. Right. <laughs> also, as I indicated, if you have if you know it's it's a threat, but it's a threat that hits 200 years from now, you have many orbits of the asteroid around the solar system to go to work on it, uh, and uh, and there, so you fly some spacecraft out to the point in its orbit where this kind of nudging is most. I mean, nudging actually. I shouldn't say nudging. That's something else. Uh, where this kind of nudging is most effective, and you do that if you have plenty of time. You could trade that for gigantic mass, for, for working on a gigantic mass. But um, the, uh, if, if you have a great deal of time, the gravity tractor becomes more attractive because you're not destroying a spacecraft. Uh, and uh, if you have a, um, a really large object, then impactor becomes less attractive and you might need to uh, do something clever with nuclear bombs which lots of people have studied and, uh, and as I said, Hollywood loves. Um, and, uh, but uh, but in, the, in the little corner of how would impactor work and is it an effective message, method, um, we now have a small scale demonstration as you, as you suggest. And, uh, and there, there would be more experiments ahead to try to get good at this and really have a technique ready in the closet for for when a real uh, world situation comes up. So I don't. I, this is the first, but probably not the last of this kind of experiment. Nothing is scheduled just now, but after they've you know worked over their results, and because this <coughs> test was a was a success, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if the people that did this uh, propose a larger <coughs> or. Uh, Test or a test on a different sort of uh, asteroid or whatever. Yeah. Would changing the mass of the asteroid change the orbital mechanics of it? So, you know, if it was on impact of Earth by changing its mass, in other words, like taking a conveyor belt or something to eject mass from it at a constant rate, change its would mass? Would changing change it go, would would that change its orbit? Well, it, the, 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 removing mass from the asteroid wouldn't change its orbit, strictly speaking. Removing mass in the way that we do with rockets, where you throw it someplace okay. and there's a recoil at the asteroid, that would change it. Um, so you could use the asteroid surface as a kind of, well, I guess we're doing that here, as a kind of rocket fuel. I mean, land a conveyor belt, start, have your astronauts start piling rocks on the conveyor belt and shoot it off the back of the asteroid in the direction you like uh, <laughs> at, uh, at whatever speed you can manage, <laughs> then yeah, that the well, land compressor would add up, and you'd be using the asteroid itself against itself. You would also be creating a whole bunch of smaller right. objects in uh, Earth-crossing orbit. Um, so that, that there might be some downside to that that you'll have to think about. Uh, I have a question over here. What? Well, yeah, I, you, you kind of half answered it, but um, I guess from what I understand. I give a lot of half answers. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, the beta values seem to be, you know, quite a bit dependent on the composition of the asteroid itself. Uh, this one seemed to be very wobbly, stuff like that. So, yeah. may have had a higher beta value because of that. Because you've got a mm -hmm. lot of projecta. Do we know that 
or at least have some set of idea about just in general, you know, the composition of a lot of the larger asteroids. Would they be similar? Would they be smoother, more <coughs> compact than the other? Um, I don't know if a larger asteroid would have a little bit more gravity to pull things together. Well, um, yeah, you're you're right in saying that uh, that the the behavior of this stuff is uh, is very dependent on the on the nature of the asteroid surface. Uh, we have visited with spacecraft. I don't know, a few dozen asteroids, and um, there's considerable variety, uh, and a bunch of them that look similar, and so, um, you know, just because we have a measurement of this one thing we hit one time, it's uh, generalizing that to other unknown asteroids with unknown surfaces is, uh, you know, is, is going to be always kind of hard. Um, <coughs> and Again, time is precious, and if you have a threat, or even a potential threat, and you have time a few orbits before the collision to send a spacecraft out to do a detailed study and find out what the surface is like and how it fits into your uh, models, that would be useful before you try to attempt a, uh, a, a deflection, because there would be a lot more uncertainties in the design of your deflection method. Yeah. Is the uh, new orbit of uh, Dimorphos supposed to be stable, or could it spiral into Didymos? It made a it made a small change in the orbit. I don't yeah. believe. I mean, I don't really know strictly know what answer an orbital mechanics person would give you to that. Uh, but I'm I'm pretty confident that it's not a it it that didn't affect the stability of the orbit. Ooh. I have a couple more slides. Oh, yeah, go ahead. On an earlier slide, you pointed out that it uses a hydrazine thruster. Is that a typical fuel burning that it, that it does on that environment? I mean, yeah, uh, the the main propulsion for DART was uh, an ion thruster, an electrical powered uh, uh, gadget that that kicks out xenon gas at very high speed, uh, xenon, xenon ions, I should say, uh, but uh, but. It, the spacecraft also had liquid fuel hydrazine monopropellant as is typical for uh, for spacecraft like this to uh, to do attitude control and small small changes in uh, in speed and direction well yeah another question i'm going to go to uh, what happens afterwards Bill? yeah we're pretty much out of time we're out of time okay can you do it quickly uh, Richie cube might look as it's still in deep space and its camera's still working on other asteroids, <coughs> that's what this slide does. And this is, describes the Hera mission, which I have uh, mentioned a couple times during the thing. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>